All right, let's go back to the word of God. We're going to deal with chapter 35, but I just want to make one comment on 34. We see in 3320, it says, then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel. So we noted that's a name for God, God, the mighty God. So it's God, the God of Israel. And that's good, but you wish he had taken what he did at meeting with him into the world during that week. Because the one thing that's missing in chapter 34 is really bringing God into things. Amen. Because Jacob really keeps silent and doesn't act on the matter, which is one level of wrong that, you know, we can sometimes think, and this is my personality, that, oh, I want to avoid conflict. So just back off and don't mention it and just try to go on, you know, and so forth. But this was the kind of matter, kind of serious sin that one can't just go on from. It needed to be addressed. And since he didn't address it, unfortunately, Simeon and Levi, as we've heard, addressed it violently and unscripturally. And as Henry pointed out, they didn't honor God by the way they did this. And think of how he made the comparison with the Gibeonites in the days of Joshua, that God didn't, after the Gibeonites were exposed, God told Joshua and the men of Israel, don't destroy them. Put them under tribute, make them hewers of wood and carriers of water. And those people were actually incorporated into the people of Israel. And when you think about what wood and water would be used for in Israel, uh, at the national level and the official level, a lot of that would go toward the tabernacle in that day. So indirectly, at least, they get involved in providing what eventually goes to the house of God. And some people believe that they're later formally discussed in the time of the monarchy in the Kings and Chronicles. But that's another sermon, as they say. You know, think of how it could have been different if these men, instead of making a pretense of going through the form of circumcision, had talked to them about their faith in God. That I just put up this altar outside of town there, and it represents my faith in God, the mighty God. And we want you to know about that God. And that God doesn't sanction sexual immorality. It's not one who likes fornication or likes rape or likes adultery. And I bear in mind what 1 Thessalonians 4 says in our age, because we could look at this and say, oh, that's ancient history, that's Genesis, that's a long time ago, that's Jacob, things are different. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Notice this statement, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So you think of how we've already seen that God looked at Leah in her circumstance, and God looked at Jacob in things he was suffering, and God could act on behalf of his people. And what would it have been if they had not only testified to God, but let's just suppose for a moment, what if Hamor and Shechem and the men of that city don't receive the faith of the true and living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, God's going to deal with those people eventually. You can commit it to God. But instead, what ends up happening is they leave a terrible testimony, a defamation on the character of what it means to be uh, an Israelite. They're not acting like princes with God. And it's noteworthy that Isaac said, uh, sorry, that Jacob says, you've made my name distinct. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say God's name. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible thing to dishonor the name of the Lord and to be a poor testimony to that. 
But, you know, let's be honest, sometimes we can be more concerned, at least I can, with our reputation than with the Lord's honor. Yeah. I want to be thought of as an honorable, honest, nice person, a good neighbor. And you've done something and this has made me look bad. Well, I understand that sentiment, but we should be more concerned about how we project the Lord to the world, how we demonstrate him. Now, after that, again, in grace, it's amazing how after you come through situations where Jacob acts badly or before him Isaac acts badly or before him Abraham acts badly, so often you get God coming in and appearing. So this is reminiscent like when Abraham and Sarah sin in Genesis 16, God appears to Abram in Genesis 17. That's when he elongates his name and Sarah's name from Abram, high father, to Abraham, father of a people or father of a multitude. And Sarah becomes Sarah, not just my princess, but a princess because it's expanded now. This is a national global blessing we have in view. And in chapter 17, God not only does that, he reiterates his promises to them. And as we've heard, gives the sign of the covenant. And again, here God appears in Genesis 35, 1. It says, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, I don't know if the altar he made before at the end of chapter 33 was something that was his idea or something that the Lord put on his heart. The scripture doesn't speak of it, doesn't censure it either. It doesn't say he was wrong. But here, most definitely, God tells him to put up an altar to God at Bethel. And he's coming back to this place where God showed him, again, as we've heard, this is the house of God. Not in the sense that God is restricted to this place, as if this is the piece of land that God dwells on, and he's not elsewhere in the world. No, we know he's omnipresent. But Henry mentioned that this thought of the gate of heaven has to do with the government of God. So you're coming back to the place, yes, where God revealed himself to you in a major way, where God is going to be worshipped by you, but it's also a place where you're acknowledging God's government. This is the God, who, after all, who has bridged the gap between heaven and earth. This is the God who has come down to man. And that's going to be later shown in history in a fuller way than what Jacob's experiencing when the Son of God doesn't take on temporary flesh as a Christophany, but he takes on flesh permanently. He becomes a man forever in, by the Incarnation. And so it's an extraordinary thing to think of. That after Jacob and his sons have shown how badly they can behave, how fleshly they can be, how selfish they can be, how cruel they can be, you might think at that point, well, the last thing I want to do is go back to meeting. The last thing I want to do is publicly worship the Lord or even privately. You know, the devil, when we fall into sin, he always wants to whisper to us, well, you shouldn't bother praying today. I mean, after what you said or what you did or what you thought, you should come into God's presence now. Ah, you shouldn't come. You know, you're, you're dirty. And the Lord is the one who in grace, of course, cleanses us. We learned that from 1 John 1, 9 and have been reminding ourselves of that verse all week. And here God calls Jacob again to come back to Bethel and worship him and to be linked to him. And this time it's very different. He says, make there an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Now, how his mind would go back in history about all God had delivered him from, all God had brought him through, and all God had given him. He could have been killed, and he could have come back with nothing. But here he's coming back, and he's already got the beginnings of what's going to become the nation of Israel. And he could reflect on all the ways God had dealt with him. Now, Jacob isn't going to enter into this lightly. We see 
beautiful picture of repentance here in verse 2. Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I've gone. So everything that Jacob wanted when Bethel was first happening in chapter 28, he now says, God has done it for me. God's Amen. been with me. God's blessed me. And he tells them to put away the foreign gods. You know, that's, again, something that might shock us. But we read in verse 4, they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their hands and the earrings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. So these things had creeped in. And of course, that's the natural human heart. There's a Christian of the Reformation era who famously said that the heart of man is a an idol factory, that our hearts naturally make idols. And it's true that if we're not careful, we can get our eyes off the true God and we can start to have false notions about God, or we can start to believe falsehoods, false versions of God that we hear about in the world. So when people say things like, a loving God would never send people to hell. Now, I don't know why a Christian really needs to struggle with that issue, okay? Because the Lord Jesus himself talked about hell more than anybody else. And I know it's a terrible thing to think about, somebody being separated from God for all eternity, but that ought to be an impetus to witness, right? That ought to be the reason we redouble our efforts in telling others the good news. It's real. It's real. So I realize it's an awful thing, but why should a Christian struggle as if this adversely affects the character of God? God's character is adversely affected if we take away hell. Because if there's no ultimate dealing with evil and putting it out of the universe, then there's no hope for the world. God has no love for mankind. See, there's a hell because God loves people. And Calvary shows he doesn't want people to go there, that he would give himself as a sacrifice to save us from that eternal perdition. And so the Lord here is so merciful to them as they come back to who God really is. In verse 5, we read, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now that is a mercy of God. Verse six. Israel today and the protection of God around that nation. That's true. <laughs> so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, God of the house of God, in other mm -hmm. words. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. And so he comes back, there's this wonderful reaffirmation of who God is in his life. Now, just because you're a believer doesn't mean you don't go through the ordinary sorrows that people face in a fallen world, a world of sin. And after this wonderful time of repentance, and we might say restoration, as they come back to Bethel, we read in verse 8, now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. And she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alon Bakut, which is the terebinth of weeping. So it was known, it was remembered. This was a sad place where we buried Deborah. Now, she must have been of some age. And it's always sad when someone dies, even if it's a believer. I fully appreciate the sentiment that Brother Raul shared with us earlier today, that we believers don't sorrow as others who have no hope. We have a joy when our loved one is with the Lord, that we have a peace about it. We can rejoice that we'll see them again. And we can think about who the Lord is and how good he is and how great his salvation is. So there can be uh, an experience where even in death and loss, we worship God and where we're thankful and we're even joyful. And the world doesn't get that. But at the same time, we don't like death. Believers 
should never say, you know, well, death is of no significance and it doesn't matter. We remember our Lord's example when he came to Bethany in John 11, how he came to the tomb and every Sunday school boy's favorite memory verse, Jesus wept, right? But the Lord entered into the grief of those around there. I mean, he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. He knew Lazarus was going to be transformed. In fact, he was going to raise Lazarus twice. He raised him in John 11, and now he's going to raise him again when he comes back at the rapture. So Lazarus is going to get a double blessing. You know, he was really restored to life in John 11. He's going to be resurrected in the sense of conformed to the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in a future day. So our Lord knew, I don't have to weep for Lazarus's ultimate destiny, but at the same time, the Lord wept over that scene of sadness, that separation, that empty spot at the table, that hole in the family circle, that repeated questioning, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. If only the Lord Jesus were here, this wouldn't be happening. And yet he showed them something greater. I don't have to be physically there. And I don't even have to heal from a distance on your timetable. I can raise Lazarus anytime I want to raise Lazarus. And ultimately, I'm going to raise him to eternal life because I'm the resurrection and the life. What a wonderful Savior we have. But it's absolutely right that these folks should mourn the death of this elderly lady. Although in one sense, you might say, well, she had a full life, but still they missed her. And as they go on, we're going to see there's going to be another death, even more sad. But I want to finish up verses 9 through 15 first. Verse 9, then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padanaram and blessed him. <clears throat> Here God blessed him, it says. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. So here's a reaffirming of that new name that he got at Peniel. And he called his name Israel. In verse 11, God said to him, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, and to your seed after you, I give this land. And so this isn't just Isaac blessing him and Isaac passing on the birthright. This is God Almighty Amen. himself Amen. pronouncing the same blessing, the same promises that were given to his grandfather and father. And then verse 13 says, God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel, the house of God. Now, he had done all that the first time around, right? Going out of the land. But it's a wonderful thing. After some years of walking with the Lord, after a lot of time has gone by, and the Lord has brought you through many things and taught you many things and worked in your life. And he has shown his reality time and time again. You come back again and you say, as we say so often at the Lord's Supper, the Lord loved me and gave himself for me. Now, when I first said that, when I was a little boy, that meant something to me. It was real. I passed from death unto life because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But, you know, now when I say it as a man on the downhill side of middle age, okay, comfortably closer to the apocalypse than some of you, as I look at the Lord through all the years since he saved me, I can say the Lord loved me and gave himself for me. And it means what it meant to me when I was a little boy, but it means even more now because now I realize even more what a good and a great God he is and how wonderful it is to be in a relationship with him and how bad I actually am apart from him, how much he saved me from, how much guilt had to be wiped away, how much the blood of Christ had to accomplish in cleansing me. And I can appreciate it further. 
And I believe that's what Jacob does here too. He comes back and he's saying, yes, God's done exactly what he said. He's lived up to his name. Now I've got a new name and that would be a challenge to live up to it, of course. But he was going to have to lean on the Lord and depend on the Lord for that. But when we come to verse 16, it's more sorrow. Then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, Benjamin in English, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Now it's one thing to set up a pillar and remember what God has done for you and say, look how good God has been. But sometimes you have to, in life, set up a pillar and remember somebody who is gone. The psalm says, the memory of the just is blessed. You know, as we think back on some of the godly people that we've known, loved ones and friends, mentioned more than once this week, has been our late brother and friend, Randy Amos. And I can think back to ways that man encouraged and impacted my life. And I can look back to my father and to my paternal grandfather, who was a believer. And I can look back to older men in our assembly and in other places that are now gone and they poured out their lives. And I commemorate them, but it's a sorrowful memory in the sense that I wish they were still here. I wish we weren't temporarily separated. And even though I'll see them again, the separation is still painful. But think of this one, that here, talk about conflicted. You get your 12th son, but your wife dies in the process. And this is the love of his life. She's dying. And as she dies, she looks at it and she says, son of my sorrow. And you can look at the experiences that happen in life and in this world, and you can think about all the sorrows that come to us. You could be like the people in that bluegrass song, I am a man of constant sorrow, you know? You can just look at all the troubles that happen in the world. And, you know, I think Jacob has one of his great moments of faith here, that he says, no, we're not going to call him son of my sorrow. Now, if anybody might have stewed in grief for the rest of his life, and believe me, I believe he, in a sense, grieved for all his life. I believe as he mentions her in his last words, he still missed her very dearly. But at the same time, he could look beyond the sorrow of that moment, of their separation, and see that God was doing something bigger. This is the son of my right hand. This is the one who God has completed this circle now, and he's going to do something with these sons. He's going to build a nation, and they are destined for great things. Now, it's been noted by many preachers over the years that these two names of this baby give you a picture of the two comings of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the first one, son of my sorrow, reminds us what Isaiah 53 says about our Lord, that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And you can think about how the Lord Jesus, above anyone, knows the suffering that comes from sin and death. Not suffering for sins he committed, of course, because he never committed them. But what sin has done to this world and what had to be done to deal with the sin question. No one knows more than the Lord, and no one suffered more, and no one more constantly encountered sorrow in this life than the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he is the son of the Father's right hand. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.22 that Jesus Christ has entered into heaven and is sat down at the right hand of God 
angels and principalities and powers being made subject to him. Hebrews likes to say he is seated on the right hand of the majesty on high. So while this was a very sad day, it's one thing to lose an elderly familiar saint, a part of your family that's been there all your life. That's sad enough. But here's his true love. Here's this woman that he was so deeply attached to. And now there comes this boy. And sometimes when this has happened in history, people reject the child that lives. They get angry and they say, well, you're the child that my wife died delivering. Now that's irrational and wrong, but it happens. It's a sad, sad thing. But I am thankful Jacob doesn't seem to take that view. He sets up a pillar to her and commemorates her, but he goes on. And of course, Matthew 2 is prophetically going to invoke Jeremiah and look back to the suffering that would eventually come to this region as children would be slaughtered there by Herod, the Edomite, the Edomaean, as he would have been known in the New Testament. And we read about Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted. So there would still be more sorrows to come in this region. But the Lord, of course, carries on his plan. And at that juncture, the amazing sin that Henry addressed, and I don't want to linger over it other than to say, what a time for Reuben to commit incest. What a time for him to defile his father's couch in the way that he did. I mean, you talk about blow upon blow, grieving over Rachel, now dealing with another boy, but a boy that's going to have to grow up without this mother. There would be surrogates, of course. There would be uh, the other ladies in the entourage to help with his care. But at that moment is when Reuben just totally thinks of himself and gives himself over to lust. What a horrible thing. But we get this list of the sons there, and then we read about the death of Isaac. So in a way, chapter 35 is a transition chapter. It's summing up what has happened in the generation of Isaac. The generation, you remember, is that literary marker. And now those characters are passing off the scene, and soon chapter 36 will take Esau off the scene and his progeny, and we're going to get to the generations of Jacob, which is going to focus on what his sons do, starting in chapter 37. So that moves us on to what we'll start with after supper. But you notice in verse 27, then Jacob, this is 35, 27, Jacob came to his father Isaac of Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now you remember when he was going to give the blessing, he said, I'm old and I don't know the day of my death. Well, I think it was going to be, you know, many decades later. I don't know if it was six decades or what the number exactly. I don't recall the chronology. Maybe somebody can help me there if you have it at your fingertips. But suffice it to say, it was still a long time coming. And Jacob was away for that 20-year sojourn, and now he comes back with his family, and Isaac gets to see this. And when he dies, Esau and Jacob bury him. Now, who would have seen that coming? You know, when Isaac first talked about dying, his sons were of each other, you know, Jacob was defrauding his brother, and Esau was vowing to kill his brother. Esau saying, you know, dad's days are numbered. He's not going to be forever. And when he dies, I'm going to take my brother Jacob out. And now in process of time, God has worked in such a way that at least Esau and Jacob come together and bury their father. They're not trying to kill one another. They're not at war. And it shows you the wonderful providence of God. Now, Esau was a profane man, so since Hebrews 12 labels him that, I rather doubt that he individually got saved, as we'd say. But nonetheless, there was at least 
peaceful coexistence between the two brothers. And I think that has to be, again, totally attributed to the grace of God, totally given to his kindness in the situation. Now, just a word on chapter 36. We're not going to go into the details, although there are things here that we could get into and, and they're profitable. We just don't have time. But suffice it to say that toward the end of this chapter, you see verse 31, for example. Now, these were the kings who reigned in the land of Eden, Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. So in a certain sense, it looks like Esau, his country, Edom, as it comes to be known, is more civilized, more advanced, like it seems to make farther progress uh, in the world, we might say, as these different kings and authorities are established. And yet we know that history is on the side of Israel, that God has said, this is my people. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And I've got a plan for them. And that plan is again going to be tested greatly because it's going to look like, never more so probably than in chapter 37, that the plan's impossible, that it cannot come to pass, that Israel's not going to become a great nation and the nations will not be blessed. It's going to look that way for a time, for a number of years, in fact. But in the dealings and workings of God, we're going to find out he and his grace and his wisdom turns things completely around and fulfills his work. But that, as they say in literature, is foreshadowing. So let's have some brother give thanks for the food, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessings we have. Thank you for this great food and for this wonderful sister. We pray in Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.